Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much to the organizer for having me to be the keynote speaker for this international conference on environmental science and applications. I'm Charles Lee with the University of Newcastle uh, based in Singapore. My topic today is on the development of an environmental sustainability ranking tool. It's called ESRT for industries. My outline today is on the sustainability journey. There are four stages in the journey. Uh, we will review that uh, in terms of compliance, environmental management systems. Uh, the third stage is industrial ecology. The fourth and last stage is zero emissions. Um, we'll talk about the ESRT development, the scoring and questionnaires development, and the applications of this tool. Now the sustainability journey, as we know, uh, is a long-term thing. Um, you can refer to my paper back in 2017 on um, this particular framework for industries. It is um, in the paper, Sustainable Advantage, Accelerating from Regulatory Compliance to environmental sustainability is in the International Journal of Environmental Sustainability in 2017. Now this framework is, um, is kind of not so new, but I think is unique in the sense that it stitches together um, this sustainability kind of journey from compliance as we see here. Uh, typically you see compliance as a uh, commonly in the, implemented in uh, companies or industries. And then we move to stage two, uh, we call it EMS, environmental management systems to industrial ecology, and ultimately to zero emissions, as well as uh, we call it the circular economy. So that's kind of uh, moving up to uh, increasing sustainability from compliance all the way to zero emissions. Now, is a journey, so it's not like a jump in terms of step by step, but uh, it's kind of a continuum that uh, moves from compliance or even below compliance to zero emissions. Now we look at stage one um, in terms of compliance to regulations, okay? So when we look at compliance to regulations, the question is um, now, what is this all about? Well, when we look at environmental regulations, there are a lot to comply with, depending on where you are operating. If you're in the United States or Europe, there's a lot of uh, compliance for different states, as well as to meet federal regulations. Now you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to um, comply, which is not an easy thing particularly if you are a global company, you would have uh, to meet compliance in many countries, in different regions. So it's not an easy thing. Um, for example, um, you know, in 2015, uh, for example, in the Thames Water uh, private company, they were fined about 220,000 pounds for discharging partially treated sewage water to the river and they killed a lot of fish and uh, sensitive aquatic life. Now, because if you're just looking at compliance, occasionally you might not comply. So you would break the rule and then you find pay fines or could end up in jail or what still the company could be shut down for uh, weeks or months. So um, it's not bad, but uh, so why is it so low in the sustainability journey? It's way down in the curve. So it's commendable to have compliance, but it's inadequate to attain long-term sustainability. So why is that? We don't have quite the time to look at it, but I'll just give you one simple example. Now, why is it inadequate? For example, if you look at a facility discharging treated wastewater, industrial wastewater that is treated already, right? It is not untreated to the river. It is complying with the regulatory standard of 
0 0.1 milligrams copper per liter, for example, right? So if you are complying, that means you are less than uh, or equals to 0 0.1, um, you are in good shape, right? You won't end up in jail. Now, if you calculate the per year loadings, loadings as example, the mass, the amount of copper going into the river. So you do a quick calculation. Basically, you have the volume of wastewater going in per day. So you could have 1 million liters of wastewater going per day, sometimes less, sometimes even more, depending on uh, how big is the facility. So it's not unusual to have 1 million liters going out per day into the river, and you multiply with the concentration, you get as much as 3.7 kilograms per year of copper going out. So in five years, you could be having uh, discharge close to 19 kilograms of copper. So where has it disappeared? Well, you're in compliance, not a problem. The copper has disappeared because it's diluted in the river. You can't even detect it, but you have a lot of copper going out. So it's diluted in the river. Um, is it good? Is it bad? Probably deposited in the sediments. So if you want to have a signature of a potential pollution of wastewater discharge, you would sample the sediments because it is adsorbed, retained, and uh, on the sediments, right? And it's a good signature. So you find in the uh, pulse, a large concentration in the sediment, which you might not even find in the water because the concentrations are below detection limit possibly. So you look at the sediments, it's gone into it. And of course, the aquatic organisms that are there, you have uh, plants taking up the copper, you have the fish, you have the, um, you know, the uh, microorganisms taking up the organisms and they are bioaccumulated. So that's not good, yeah? And the other toxics besides copper, um, depending on the industrial processes, phenolics, solvents, volatile organics, a lot of pollutants going out. So you have to um, go towards uh, lowering the uh, discharge, right? To as much as going towards uh, less and less concentrations all the way to zero emissions. So the second stage is environmental management systems. So we look at, um, for example, um, a different management systems. I see 14,001, which is common, is a worldwide, uh, EMS, voluntary, uh, and you can see that it's uh, very powerful in the sense that it's continual improvement up till hopefully that you have zero emissions. So every year that you are certified, you have to keep uh, not only to improve, but to improve in terms of double digits uh, with respect to the discharge of your pollutants, right? So it's a good thing you're not stagnant, and uh, although it's voluntary and not regulated. So in Europe, if you have a plant, you would need to uh, meet EMAS, which is the Eco-Management Audit System, yeah? which is another uh, EMS system in the world. The US one, if you're working with a United States company, likely you'll have the responsible care as we see in the left and corner here, extreme left. Um, that's another EMS, right? That is uh, in most uh, plants that are under the US system. So assume compliance is good, voluntary, continuous improvement, and it's huge opportunities to influence the subcontractors, your uh, supply chain, you know, greening the supply chain. You can use this uh, EMS system to leverage over the suppliers. Um, which are a lot of them out in the marketplace. Moving on then to the third stage, you must have heard of industrial ecology. And basically this is looking at industrial ecosystems, industries that are pretty good, you know, on industrial systems, but then you have ecology, which is basically a natural system, biological system, ecosystems and biological ecosystems are not perfect, but they are sustainable. They've been around since Mother Earth was created. So the industrial systems are trying to mimic the biological systems so that it's sustainable, right? And if you look at this particular diagram, 
the current systems, uh, the older systems, you have the industries, and you have a sort of a uh, small overlap with the natural system. And in the new system, moving into industrial ecological systems that are mimicking nature, the natural system is the system, right? It's the priority. You know, we are in a natural environment like the forest, and you want to build your industrial system, you know, including your entire factory in a natural system rather than, you know, as a part of it, right? It's embedded in the natural system, okay? As you can see the change uh, from the old to the new. And ultimately, um, we don't have time to dwell on this, but you can read my paper as well as uh, the concept of zero emissions is uh, not uncommon. And another uh, very sexy term that we are talking about for zero emissions is the circular economy, right? According to the World Economic Forum, is basically an industrial system that is restorative or regenerative by design. It replaces the end of life concept with restoration, right? Industrial ecology, life cycle assessment where um, your end of life, the product is uh, at the end. Um, we talk about recycling it, reusing it, that's not bad, but it's probably also inadequate. Right? We want to take the uh, product back to life, like cradle to cradle, right? We restore it, repair it, and then you want to design uh, the uh, product from the beginning so that it is, can be reused recycle, regenerate it, so that you're using less energy, uh, less toxic chemicals, okay? So this is uh, the industrial ecology uh, moving to a circular economy system. So other terms would be cradle to cradle, biomimicry, uh, high level industrial ecology, regenerative design, as well as blue economy and performance economy. So. We look at a linear economy on the left, where it is, you would take the resources, make it, uh, dump it, dispose it. So this linear is not sustainable, right? It creates a lot of waste. So as you know, we are consuming huge amounts of resources that is not sustainable, right? The metals that we use are running out, just like oil and gas. So they are finite. So we need to go to a circular economy where we will make, um, where we will be very careful in extracting the natural resources. We make it carefully, so it's a green design. Um, the product can be, at the end of life, can be easily regenerated, reused and recycled. So it's a loop, so it's a yeah, endless loop, so that it's, uh, we will conserve the, not only the energy, but the environmental footprint of the product. So, so we move to the ESRT, so the Environmental Sustainability Ranking Tool uh, that we have developed is based on that, um, you know, the four stage uh, concept of the environmental journey, environmental sustainability. So read that up uh, if you're interested. So our focus here today is on the ESRT, how it's developed and how we can apply it to industries. So the ESRT um, in a nutshell uses seven environmental performance indicators. We call it EPI acronym developed by the Global Reporting Initiative. We will call it GRI. Now the GRI is a robust world standard, um, you know, that is used for sustainability reporting, which is, as you know, increasingly used by large companies as well as uh, mid-sized to small companies to do their sustainability reporting, which is very important to not only meet uh, uh, stock exchange listed companies' compliance to sustainability, but increasingly are required as well as um, in the marketplace. So that it shows that your company is serious about sustainability. So other uh, things that are used to leverage 
to develop this ESRT is myself with uh, two other authors that have a lot of experience in environmental health and safety. So we are leveraging our extensive experience in auditing companies as well as in consulting, as well as in research and teaching to uh, develop this tool. So the seven EPIs, uh, those shown in green here, uh, the areas that we looked at are benchmark against materials, energy, water, biodiversity, emissions, influence and waste, products and services and transport. So these are the seven indicators that we highlight in the tool, right? We will see more of it later. So this is the journey, the uh, four stage. So for each stage, we will embed the seven EPI, the seven environmental performance indicators in each of the stage, right? So how do we benchmark the companies? So we'll start putting in these EPIs and moving to developing a scorecard, right? The tool is basically to be more quantitative, I forgot to mention, to how can we come up with a quantitative measure of the extent of sustainability, how sustainable is the company using this tool. So we're trying to quantify it. So we use the seven EPIs. Uh, we're going to have um, scores put on each of these indicators. All right. So in a nutshell, it might be hard to um, understand, but this table shows the four stages, right? On the left, the stages, EPI, they are seven EPIs, environmental performance indicators. And for each EPI, our questionnaire, basically we're developing a questionnaire with a scorecard. For each question, um, how would the industry, a chemical company, for example, perform? Would they have answered the question uh, poorly, fairly, or excellently, or very, very good? So we have a scorecard. So the perfect score is 98, close to 100. So we could get a uh, rounding it off, you could get a perfect score of 400. So if we had a perfect, an ideal company, it would score 400, impossible, but uh, that's the perfect score. So let's see how we develop these uh, scorecards, all right? So if you break it down, we come down to, you remember, um, stage one, that's compliance, there are four stages, right? Stage one, I'll walk you through uh, step by step. Stage one, the EPI we will use is materials, right? There are seven, seven EPIs. So let's look at materials. And uh, you look at this table, we have uh, seven questions. So for materials, we have seven questions. So question 1.11, we'll post a question in a questionnaire. We'll see later in terms of uh, you know, how are you sourcing your materials? I mean, as a general question, you know, through which source, which supplier, so on and so forth. So we have specific questions related to materials. So we look at, uh, ideally, we interview the uh, company's eh &S manager. For us, as a first cut, we are getting the data from the sustainability reporting and extract the data. So, is it uh, able to uh, score poorly? Then it'll be a low of 0 0.4. Or it answers this perfectly, you know, the questionnaire, then it's 1.0. So the perfect score is two. And so that's how we get a score of 14 across. Uh, if they're all uh, answering it as a perfect score, uh, good answer, excellent. And um, the scores, we have 14. And so you have a, for this materials of EPI, you have a perfect score of 14 for stage one compliance and materials, right? So if we took um, the materials, as you can see, in one of the EPI, there are seven EPIs, right? So we're still in stage one. Um, and we'll see we have energy, water, materials, so on and so forth, seven EPIs. Each EPI, you can score 14 as a perfect score. So 14 times seven 
is 98. So you round it off, you have 100. Okay, so these scores are um, developed from the poor, fair, and excellent scores, right? So there are only three levels. So 14 times 7 is 98, and we round it off as 100. That's for stage one, uh, the perfect score 100. And you go to stage two, three, and four, each one is 100, right? Each stage has seven APIs, yeah, all right? So this is an example, a bit small, but it's deliberate because we we not gonna show you all the questionnaires. Uh, we haven't had this published yet. But for example, uh, just mentioning about uh, materials, right? So materials with respect to uh, stage two, what's the question? So the question, there are seven questions on so we ask um, the first question, 211, has the organization documented and implemented an EMS to cover the material usage and handling, right? So that's a question. So if they don't have uh, from the interview or from the SR report, the organization looks like it doesn't have evidence for documentation of EMS, so it's poor. So you have a great a score all the way to excellent. The, organizer, the organization has a full documentation of the EMS over X number of years. So it's as a full score then, right, of 2.0. And then the questions go on related to EMS uh, all the way to 217. So there are seven questions related to EMS. One could be related to the supply chain. And are you using your EMS to leverage over your suppliers, right? Again, poor, fair, excellent. So that's an example of a questionnaire that's developed. Seven questions, so we go to the each stage. So we jump to here now. Each stage has uh, seven times seven. There's seven EPIs, seven questions. So it's 49 questions, right? So we could have as many each stage, one, two, three, four. One stage has 49 questions, four stages, 49 times four is 196 questions. So we have as many as about 200 questions in this entire ESRT questionnaire set, right? To uh, post to the uh, company, um, we can extract information from the SR report to try to populate it to get a score. Um, best would be we can uh, get the manager to fill it up, uh, as well as uh, meet up if we can as an interview with them to have a one-to-one -one session to um, you know, populate this um, database. So with that, we'll have a scorecard. So how can we use this um, to help us in this sustainability reporting? Well, here it is. So once you have the scores, that's developed, so we need to populate it based on the company's performance on the data, on the sustainability reporting, you know. So your compliance, you have EMS, right? Uh, industrial ecology, zero emissions, so we have different scores. So within the company, so you don't have to go to a benchmark against other companies. So within the company, because your company has different plans, one in Singapore, or even two in Singapore, you know, another one in Vietnam, uh, three in um, China, one in Korea, you know. So you can look at the company, how they are performing, right, within the company, uh, within the same company, but different plans, you know, different uh, production facilities across the region. So internally, you can compare them. Now, these are the comparing the EPIs. So how are they doing with respect to materials, with respect to biodiversity, um, with respect to um, transport, energy, and water, the footprint, right? So there's seven footprints, seven indicators. So for each stage, so you can compare them um, as you get data over one year, year-to-year -year comparisons using this tool. So very powerful, I think. Um, then if we are ambitious, 
uh, we'll compare between companies, right? Not so good for companies that are not doing so well, but um, we don't tell them who is the company, but within an industrial cluster, like in mining, in pharmaceutical, and all the gas, you know, so the clusters, how are they comparing in the region? Um, then you have the different companies, you know, for each stage, you have this data, which is pretty good stuff, I think. So what we did then using that tool, we tested it out. So we are um, now, um, how did we get the data? Well, we took the sustainability reports um, of eight large mining companies, all right? So, you know, they are pretty good companies. And then uh, they are, have a lot of issues on uh, environmental health and safety, environmental compliance. Um, they would like to be referred to as um, green sustainable companies, right? Uh, there's extremely challenging mining companies, the mines, yeah? Um, in Australia, in China, in Brazil, you know, they could be hugely polluting, so you want to have it under control, um, as well as the processing and then the uh, delivery of the coal or the um, iron ore bauxite, you know, to be processed as well as shipped overseas. Okay, so we took the data from, uh, we're not going to get all the data, but we extract uh, as much information as we can from the sustainability reports, which are quite extensive for mining companies because they have to be transparent. Um, populated uh, our database, you know, give them scores. So you see the scores here ranging from 150 to 282 out of 400. So it's not bad, you know, 282. So we use our tool and we got this data. Um, so we have not had a chance to uh, talk to them or interview them, but we were testing our, how robust is our tool to use for an industrial cluster. So you can plot it. So uh, the eight companies, different stages, uh, the total score for each stage. Yeah, so a lot of things you can do in terms of their performance. And so um, it's quite useful. Um, the next stage is to use it for other industries as well as to roll it out to our actual uh, data that we can collect from uh, specific companies and industrial clusters, right? Going beyond the sustainable, sustainability reporting uh, annual reports that you can get from the internet. Okay. So in conclusion, um, this ESRT tool, I mean, think it's very powerful. Um, you know, there are a lot of details that goes into developing it. So um, it's not published yet, but we hope to by this year. But the um, benchmarking against the framework is published. That's the industrial um, framework for um, sustainability. That's in 2017, you can read it up that comes up with the four stages. So it's a powerful tool. We can rank environmental sustainability performance of industries. And then you can have uh, performance checks across the seven GRI environmental aspects we talked about, right? From materials to biodiversity to um, water, so on and so forth. So they're crucial for Singapore, uh, which um, I work here in, as well as Asian-based companies, you know, to have this data uh, to comply with country-specific, for example, the Stock Exchange of Singapore, as well as the uh, country-specific sustainability regulations that are, if not already here, they are all coming in very aggressively in listed companies. Um, if we can use that to benchmark against peers within the same industrial cluster, as I mentioned, in oil and gas, in aviation, and uh, chemicals, as well as electronic companies. Um, last but not least, um, you are aware of the United Nations Sustainable 
developmental goals, there's 17 of them. Um, this tool will help you uh, meet the goal 12, which is uh, dealing with responsible consumption and production through reducing our ecological footprint by changing the way we produce and consume goods and resources. So, you know, you want to be a good citizen, so um, this tool can help you meet this SDG 12, right? As well as I'm sure other SDGs that are there, depending on what you are processing and making uh, in the industry. There's other SDGs like life on water, life on land, and uh, a lot of uh, good SDGs. And the future, as I had mentioned earlier, is to roll it out to uh, the actual industry, to the chemical company, uh, specific ones to ask them to voluntarily um, fill up the questionnaire so that we can uh, have an internal score that they can use it internally. They can uh, help them benchmark the sustainability ranking. Um, as well as then they can compare it with the other plants that they have across the region, uh, as well as uh, more intimate data we would like to collect would be for, from one-to-one -one interviews with the companies. So with that, uh, that wraps up my presentation. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the university for providing us with a small research grant to start this project. We hope to publish it very soon to Anita Rios, who is our adjunct uh, local lecturer, as well as a research assistant, uh, Nancy Shen. Um, you can write to me if you need more information or would like to collaborate. I'm happy to. Uh, with that, thank you very much and have a good um, conference for the rest of the next two days. Bye-bye.